Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anita Zucker, and I get to introduce our amazing guests today. I want to welcome Simon Sabag Montefiore and Kate Bennett, his interlocutor, as well as the audience to this afternoon's session. Thank you so much to Alla and Ralph Isham and to Dr. Jack Schaefer for being the sponsors of this particular session. And yay. So Simon Sabag Montefiore was born June 27, 1965. He's a British historian, television presenter, author of popular history books and novels, including Stalin, The Court of the Red Tsar, and a few others, especially today's session, which is about the world, a family history of humanity, among many others, but that's what the theme of today's session is about. Simon, again, um, was born to um, Stephen Eric Sabag Montefiore, and he was great-grandson of the banker Sir Joseph Sabag Montefiore, the nephew and heir of the wealthy philanthropist Sir Moses Montefiore. Montefiore worked as a banker, a foreign affairs journalist, and a war correspondent covering the conflicts during the fall of the Soviet Union. He lives in London with his wife, the novelist San Santa Montefiore, and their two children. The couple are friends of King Charles and Queen Camilla. And Montefiore was appointed as a trustee of the National Portrait Gallery in September of 2021. He's also closely involved in interfaith relations. He interviewed on stage the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, at an interfaith event hosted by the Board of Deputies of British Jews at, English's, at England's oldest synagogue, Beavis Mark Synagogue. And now let me introduce Kate Bennett, our interlocutor today. Uh, um, Kate has been a CNN reporter, the only journalist in the White House press corps to cover the first lady and the first family. She has been a lifestyle journalist for almost two decades, chronicling the intersection of people, pop culture, fashion, and politics. For CNN, Kate covered the First Lady, and she is the author of Free Melania. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kate and Simon, and to our sponsors. Enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you. So we're just going to dive in, if that's OK. They, they didn't mention your birthday. No, only they didn't. mine. Nor my, my, my grandparents. Or no, nor your grandparents. I don't have I as fancy was, friends, yeah, though. I, well, <laughs> I, <laughs> anyway, but it's, it's, it's great to be here. It's lovely to be here. I just wanted to say, if you haven't read Simon's book, you, you should. It's a history. But if you think that history is dry or dull or pedantic. I'm just going to go through some chapter names in Simon's book. Star Wars, Pierce Penises, Sex Slaves, and Steam Baths. <laughs> Murder by Enema. Uh, the Rule of, I'm not going to say that one. <laughs> the sea and the sea. Don't you dare. The sea and the, and now we have high school kids in here. Oh, yeah. I'm not. Uh, Mozart, Joseph, and Continual Erections. Sally Hemings and Marie Antoinette, The Diamond Necklace and the Love Cabbage. Um, I mean, these are really fascinating, compelling chapter titles, and I, I encourage everybody to, to dig in there. But I, I'm curious why you decided to tell such a vast history through families and through, uh, through these eras of families throughout over time. Well, I always, I, I always follow, um, my, my, one of my heroes is Benjamin Disraeli, and he always said, you know, when I want to read a book and I can't find it, I write it myself. <laughs> and um, and uh, so this book, in a way, is a tribute to um, Dizzy because, I, 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 like many of you, I, I read a lot of world histories. And world histories are now a sort of huge phenomenon. There's one, there's one that comes out every week from somewhere. Every university has a professor of world history. And, I, I, of course, I had to read them all when I was writing this. But many of them are quite dry and detached from people. I mean, they're, they're filled with commodities and, and trade routes and new discoveries and pandemics and empires falling. On the other hand, 
as you know, as Americans, of course, biographies are getting longer and longer. I mean, the latest biography of Henry Kissinger, for example, by Neil Ferguson, yep. is a thousand pages before he's even met Nixon. <laughs> so, so, you know, and I've written biographies of Stalin as well, and Catherine the Great, and so on. So I, I love biography. But what I was trying to do was find a way to write a book with the span of world history, but the intimacy of biography. And I, I, I thought it could be done. And so I wrote a proposal, as you do. And this is the terrible thing about being a writer, as you know, Kate. It's like, you know, you write these proposals. Yes. And then after about six months, you have to write the damn thing. <laughs> and you have to think how to do it. And so I agonized about how to do it. And my mother, who was about 93 at the time, um, she said to me, she said to me, Simon, give the money back. Give the money back. It's absolutely, it's not worth the stress of trying to do this, because you need, she was a typical sort of Jewish mother. She said, I'm very worried about your sleep. And I, I you know. So anyway, she, she, she's no longer with us, so she never saw the book oh, arrive, sadly. Okay. Okay. But it then occurred to me that, you know, I've written one book, a sort of history of Russia through the Romanov dynasty. Right. And I've also written a history of the Middle East through Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. But it, that book uses families to tell the, the story of the Middle East. And some of them are great Arab families, some of them are great Palestinian families, some of them are Jewish or Israelite or whatever, but and many of them are neither. Many of them are, uh, there are Turks and British and so on. But it, it, the great thing about family is um, it ticks so many boxes. The one thing I wanted to avoid in this was that kind of staccato, a battle, an empire falls, someone dies, someone's assassinated. What I wanted to get was the continuity, the way that the, you know, the, the, the threshold of doors is kind of, is kind of worn down by feet mm -hmm. passing over it. And family does that, but also family does a lot of other things yeah. that, are, that are of our time. Yeah. Um, you know, diversity, real, uh, you know, to write a, a book that's really a world history, of uh, women in, in power, I'm sure we're gonna discuss all these things. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things I decided to do was, you know, you could do with the families is, treat, say, the, the kings of Benin or Congo or the emperors of China exactly as you would treat the Kennedys, the Rockefellers, the Windsors, the Habsburgs. And right. that hasn't really been done before. No. And you do it so well. I was thinking to myself, you know, the Romanovs, the Ottomans, the Habsburgs, they're so, that makes the Kennedys, like, feel Amish. I mean, it really puts them, yes. like, yeah. Well, the Kennedys, really are, well, obviously, they only had one president, so right, they're not exactly. really who, much who of a cares? dynasty. No, but I love that you said that about, because I think history, and, and you talked about the length of, of biographies these days, it becomes sort of, can be dull and plodding, but to get there through, you know, a 12-year-old pharaoh or, like, the, uh, these amazing matriarchs early in history when women really did rule and have power and make very calculating sort of sometimes violent decisions and I love the evolution of as you say wearing down the threshold. Well another great thing about families of course just you know, to be serious for a second is like you know families do always reflect the economic the cultural the religious norms of their time mm -hmm. and they always reflect how, how work is functioning and how whether people you know, families are changed when people go to work, when they come back from work, when women start working, when children work. Um, all these things are reflected in the shape of families. So though the kind of biological family is, you know, of mum and dad has basically always been the same and always will be the same, however, however complex our, you know, our uh, menages become um, as society changes, um, the actual, the, the, the actual idea of family as an economic unit, as a political unit, as a religious unit, as an imperial unit, is constantly changing. But the Kennedys, of course, are interest, you know, are always interesting because sure. you know dynasty is still so important in in the world, yeah. and is is becoming more important all the time. And you know, you have a Kennedy running for president again. Yes, yes, and I'm sure, you you're, know, I'm sure you're very proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Trump family, the, I just finished the Mitt Romney uh, biography. Yeah. I mean, that the whole, another family. It really exists there in time. But um, how did you sort of fundamentally skip from, not skip, but pass from one era into the other, even if they were seemingly very, very different? Well, well not just geopolitically, but just yeah. geographically. And well, that was the huge, there were huge challenges writing this book. Right. I mean, the first one was, you know, would family even work? at all, as a, you know, could this be done at all? So what I did was I got a huge sort of 
um, sheet of sort of poster-sized paper on my on my kitchen table, and I just <laughs> worked out the three mega families that are the heart of the book. So there's the there's the Genghis Khan family right. um, who start in about a thousand A.D. and go all the way through through to Tamerlane. Um, and slightly change with Tamil and then go to the Mughals of India and so on. So that's a sort of that's sort of the Eurasia. Mm -hmm. um, then in Europe, there's a fam there's a sort of family that goes all the way through from Clovis, the Merovingians, who started about 400, 500 A.D., through the Hofstaufen and and um, and and then into the Habsburgs, and via Charlemagne. So that's the sort of that's Europe from about 500 to 1918. Mm -hmm. And so that, I thought that, that, that's done Europe. And then the Middle East. Check. The Middle East. Um, of course, the greatest dynasty in the Middle East is the family of the prophet himself. And all, many great dynasties are directly descended from the prophet, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Fatimids. And even today, Jordan is still ruled by the Hashemites, who were a big family in the book. You might say that leaves out Africa, that leaves out the Americas, but they're not left out. They're all in there. I was going to say, they're all and, pretty much in there. But what your, your, your point is really well taken, because, of course, the center of the, center of the narrative is Afro-Eurasia, right. which is all, Africa has always been part of this system. Um, uh, and so, so that, that's the center of it. The problem was to bring in Australia and the Americas. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what you're referring to. And that was really difficult. And that took a certain sleight of hand to bring them in. Yeah. Um, it was very useful, for example, when a sort of when the when the emperor of Mar the Mansa of Mali set off with boats to conquer somewhere in the Atlantic and never came back. For example, that gave me a, that gave me a chance to jump to the Americas. Right. But generally, the whole point of the book is that I wanted to get the feeling of the contingency, the chaos, the messiness mm -hmm. of human life and politics, mm -hmm. where someone like Joe Biden has many things on his desk. He doesn't know which is going to be the late next thing to blow up. Right. And it isn't all, it's, all, it's often the very thing that his national security advisor has said is completely going to be quiet for the next 10 years. So, um, so I wanted to get that feeling and a feeling of, of world affairs. And though we think of modern times as the first truly global era, actually, since the first century AD, you know, leaders have had international uh, and international policies and world affairs has been kind of global or kind of world um, uh, world spanning. Mm -hmm. And so what I do in the book deliberately is you'll be in Berlin and then it skips immediately to Washington right. or to or to Beijing or something and you don't know when it's going to come back. Mm -hmm. And but it's all one narrative and it's all linked together. And I love the visual of the ha of having the white the piece of paper the, that you actually sort of mapped that out and yeah. and, and did you have to refer back to, okay, now there I was, we were, I mean, how did that? Well, I started with the plan, but, you know, but, All the but as, Klaus, as Klaus Witz <laughs> said, you know, few plans survive contact with the enemy. Right. And so um, it's very, that's very true of my books. And um, so I, you know, I, 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 I started with that plan, and they are still the center of the book. Mm -hmm. But the whole fun of it is the unexpected. It's filled with surprises, I hope. Yes. Where you don't know, I mean, obviously, there are lots of th dynasties and families that you would expect to find in here, mm -hmm. you know, like the Roosevelts, the Bushes, um, the, the Sachs Cobergs, and the, and the Hohenzollerns. But there are also all sorts of families in the book. It's not just about royal families. Yeah. Um, many of them are, fa uh, there are families of enslaved people, there are families of enslaved people who became monarchs, yeah. there, are, there, are, there are hereditary novelists, historians, um, doctors, executioners, and, and so on. So, yeah. so um, Thomas Paine, you know, during the American Revolution, he famously said, you know, a, a, hereditary, a hereditary ruler is as absurd as a hereditary postman. But, but my postman <laughs> is the good. son of my old postman, <laughs> and so I can disprove Thomas Paine right there. <laughs> Terrific. Well, I wondered about that, too, that sort of, you know, as you as we travel through the world and, and history in this book, you know, you see things sort of come together a little more formally. It really was messy back in the day. I mean, it was cutthroat, quite literally, all the way up until, I mean, Napoleon, I mean, really were, things got normal, normalized 
much sooner to present day than one would think. It was really chaotic. Is that because there was no, I mean, we talked a little bit about empires versus nations backstage and, yeah. and democracies and things. There was no order. It was just who, who can stab so-and-so in the back quickest and not have mom or dad find out. Well, one forgets, one does forget all the time, because we've just coming out of a sort of 70-year period of, of an ex exceptional period, which we might talk about again later, you know, of, of peace and order in the world, one forgets that that is so exceptional right. and so unusual. One also forgets that during that period, we took democracies and the increase of democracy around the world as for, for granted, while in fact, democracies are very recent. I mean, just, just one thought, you know, one thought, of course, you know, America, by some estimations, didn't become a full democracy till 1965. In Europe, um, which we one always think, oh, that's the home of democracy. No, I mean, when I was growing up, Eastern Europe was a dictate, was a Stalinist dictatorship, sure. yeah. and Western Europe, Portugal and Spain were dictatorships. Yeah. So all of this is very recent and very fragile. So I think that's that's part of it, um, and of course. Western Europe, or the West, as we call it, the America, the North America in the West, has become more orderly, and you know, and has become orderly since, I guess, the 19th century. But actually, that doesn't apply to the rest of the world at all. No, it doesn't. And we often think, and one of our mistakes has always been to think that the rest of the world is going to, is keen to emulate us or follow our ways, and that has led to some catastrophic errors of our foreign policy, of course, and. Um, you know, when one talks about families, for example, yeah, I mean, family life is pretty messy when there's power involved. Yes. And people love to say that. And of course, it's very true that nothing poise, so poisons the nest of family love than power and money. Right. Um, but on the other hand, all of us are, are members of families. We're all members of little dynasties. Mm -hmm. Samuel Johnson said, you know, every, every kingdom is a little family, every little family is a, every family is a little kingdom. And that's very true. And um, we all know that even when there's nothing at stake, families can be very vicious. Yeah. Um, you know, and and there are there are jealousies and rivalries um, in all of our families. And of course, power, adding power to that makes it you know that much more um, intense. Do you do you think about now without you know just speaking broadly, this era in the world and, and what's happening globally? Is there a section or an era or a family from the book that sort of is a harbinger, or you, or you say we should pay attention to this era? Or that I mean, or well, I think I think that in this era, um, uh, you know, I, I think that, that the family that really represents this era. I, I'm always asked, you know, wh what is the most famous family in history? Mm -hmm. And I think they expect me to say the Habsburgs or the Rothschilds or the <laughs> Medici or something, who, all of whom are in the book, of course. Um, and, and, I'll, and the answer is the Kim family of North Korea, because the Kim family of North Korea are the only dynasty in history to ha have the ultimate uh, family heirloom, a nuclear arsenal. And so they are the most, famous, they're the most powerful family in world history, without a doubt, yeah. and, um, which, which concentrates the mind, doesn't it? And um, I, think, I think one thing one needs to realize is that in America or in Western Europe, Britain, where I'm from, um, you know, we're, we're always slightly congratulating ourselves that we have, you know, families don't really become too powerful in our world and that we have, um, and that reflects a sort of a sophisticated mm -hmm. um, political life where, um, you know, corruption, venality and, and, and patronage are held within boundaries. Right. And that is the definition of, of our Western democracies the open world, I call it in the book. Um, but actually family is, is, becoming very, is becoming ever more important today in, in, this, in, in this world we live in now. And partly that reflects the failure of many of the states created after 1945 mm -hmm. during the American, during the democratic ascendancy when all those decolonized states in Africa and in other places were, were drawn by Western map, map drawers and a lot of them haven't really coalesced as nation states, mm -hmm. which is why the army is always seizing power, because yeah. the army was, was inherited by these nation states from the local regiments of the colonial powers, and they became the only institution that was really national mm -hmm. in these newly created states like, say, Nigeria, Ghana, places right. like this. Um, 
But family is more important than ever. I mean, there are four sorts of family power now. Um, the first is what you have in America, um, where you have oh. the Trumps, the, the, you know, the, the Bidens, the, you, know, you have what I call demo dynasties. You could, right. The great thing is the Bushes are the most successful in recent years. And the great thing about them is that you get the continuity, you get the stability, you get the reassurance of the name but you can get rid of them if they're useless, <laughs> and you can vote them vote out. Vote them out, <laughs> yeah. And the most successful of the, all of those, by the way, is not in America, but in India, the, great, the world's greatest democracy, where the Nehru family mm -hmm. dominated India for 60 years and may again one day. But, um, so that, that's, that's one. To, and of course, you, know, you can see in Kenya, in Philippines, they've just elected Ferdinand Marcos uh, again, so on. So those mm -hmm. are demo dynasties. The second sort of what we have in Britain, which is the idiosyncratic um, uh, constitutional monarchy. Right. And it, it, it makes no sense, and yet it works perfectly. And <laughs> that's all you can say. It's idiosyncratic. But if you look at Northern European um, democracies, it works very well. The yeah. weird thing about you know, those, those countries is they have no, we, they, there's no Kennedys, there's no Marcoses, there's no families in those, there's no political families really in those right. countries, as if the human need for the um, familiarity of family is satisfied by the constitutional monarchies. And then, of course, you have absolute monarchies, um, the most important being MBS in Saudi Arabia, who are like more important than ever now, and about to become ever more important in, in the coming weeks and months. And then finally, you have what I call sort of republic monarchies, like, like the Kim family mm -hmm. in, in, and actually, this is spreading, I mean, across the world, um, and you look in many, many countries, Pakistan, um, Afghanistan, the Taliban is virtually a family right. business right. with the Haqqani family. Mm -hmm. um, there are about four cabinet ministers are from that family. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that is spreading and that is becoming more important everywhere. And everybody is trying to make their children succeed them. Most recently, Hun Sen in, in Cambodia has just appointed his son prime minister, but there are lots of other examples. So family is ever more important. It is, it is strange how a, sort of such an ancient feeling uh, platform like a family still exists in terms of power. And is, should, it be, should it be eliminated? Should everyone, I mean, w w if, if the power hub of a family goes away, right, and we don't keep repeating the same, would that be better for the world or worse? It might be, but the thing is, all political life, what's it all for? I mean, why do, all, why do all these systems exist? I mean, family is the predominant political system on, in human history. Right. What, why? Why, does, why do we have any of these systems? They're all to provide stability, security, reassurance in a terrifying world. Mm -hmm. And they're all different ways to get it, and they all have disadvantages. And advantages. I mean, democracies are wonderful, but of course, every four years you get, a, you get, you get the whole policy changes, so they're very inconsistent. Right. The whole point of democracies is you get a leader who has no experience in anything and knows nothing about anything until they've started to rule, <laughs> which we think is great, but is it? Can be very, can be disastrous. Right, well, that's, um, I mean, that's you know, the question. On the other hand, and its foreign policy is completely inconsistent and sort of, and, and spasmodic. Yeah. On the other hand, the great thing about dictatorships and autocracies and, and um, dynasties is that you have people who are trained, so you, have con you know who they, they're gonna, it's gonna succeed, so there's continuity. There's a very, very experienced ruler mm -hmm. who knows how to run things because he's done it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. But then the disadvantage is you can't get rid of them. Right, um, you're stuck with them. When they, when they take a bet, they risk whole peoples and, and the lives of millions. Um, and um, and so, so, you know, that, that's, and they become very rigid in the end, yeah. as you saw with, as you can see with Putin, for example. Right. So, there are disadvantages and advantages, and, and, and it's amazing how often family, family rule has worked terribly well. Well, I mean, that's the thing. Is it, does it keep the, the citizen placated or sort of feeling like someone's, someone's driving the boat, or, or well, does I'm not, it... I'm not suggesting that we all t convert to absolute no. monarchies, <laughs> I by the know, way. But it I, I'm sure you're not either. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I've covered the White House too closely yes. to think about it. But, but, you know, I, I, it is interesting to, to, to think that is, are people around the world more settled knowing that they know, you know, little Prince Louis at some point is going to be, you know. Um, I, think, I think the real, the real answer to that is you know, the reason why so many countries that look like democracies, because everywhere looks the same now, I mean, all countries all over the world 
have, the, have an American or British system yeah. for obvious reasons, because those are the two most powerful countries in the world, or, or a French system in West Africa. Um, and and um, they all look the same, but many of them actually are sort of monarchies, as I said. Right. Um, and the reason why everyone's turned back to families or has never left families is because those states have failed to provide reassurance and, and justice and security, and people have gone back to, to family units, to clans, to patronage, to mm -hmm. connections, to provide that reassurance. And that, that's often disastrous. And, you know, talking about these families, I mean, you know, these families, are, the rule of many of these families has been cataclysmic. Um, you know, I mean, the most desperate, the, most, the, mo the family I'd least like to be to be a member of, I would guess, would be the Ptolemies of, yeah, of Egypt. That, that's pretty where, brutal. <laughs> where, where, where Fatso Ptolemy, as he was known, um, <laughs> argued with his wife so badly that he, he chopped up his, his son and sent it to his wife in bits. Yeah. So, so, um, so it can be, you know, it can be a terrible system. Yeah. And there's no doubt about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. That um, that one is. The Herod fam, the Herod family weren't much better. Who were they, they were contemporaries of the Ptolemies, and the Ottoman family, as you as you you know as you know, not going into too many details, um, but you know when they came to power, they often had to they often wiped out all their brothers and nephews and nieces and uh, nephews to provide to provide you know security for the throne. Yeah. Right. So. It's a, very, it's a very dangerous thing to be a member of an of a, of a, of a imperial dynasty um, before modern times. And even, in, and even now, I mean, you only have to look at what's happened with the Kim family in North Korea right. and the Assad family yeah. in Syria, who are another big family that are, that are, that are talked about in the book a lot. Um, because we go right up to the present. I mean, the book ends on the day of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And, and what did you learn from, you know, having, having really delved into Stalin and, and Putin? Do you, do you, can you draw a thread there? And yeah, well, I mean, Putin is, is you know, Putin is, 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 um, uh, is kind of channeling both the Romanov czars mm -hmm. and, um, and Stalin. And in fact, you know, when I wrote my Catherine the Great and Potemkin book in, in, in 2000, it came out 23 years ago, it's my first book. And Catherine and, Potem Catherine and the Potemkin are an amazing couple. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, they are Russian imperialists, one right. has to say that these days, um, but very different from the Russian imperialists now ruling Russia. Sure. And they were children of the Enlightenment, and they had this passionate love affair. And they, they wrote about it in amazingly um, outrageous letters that were both uh, romantic, erotic, political, cultural, um, gossipy. And I was very lucky to work on these letters for about uh, two years. Yeah. And the interesting thing was that because Stalin had said, like, we're not interested in Catherine the Great and Potemkin, um, we're interested in Peter the Great and Ivan the Terrible and kind of male, macho um, sort of autocrats, no one had really studied Catherine the Great much. And so when I wrote the book, I loved writing it, but it was an amazing experience. Sure. When, I, when I published it in English, obviously, I was contacted by the new government of Russia. Um, and the new president was this amazing person who was acclaimed by your president and my prime minister as a hope for the future, a liberal, um, a liberal reformer, Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and, and I was, I was contacted by them. And, they, and the, the minister of culture contacted me. Oh, really? And said to me, listen, the new president or, as they say in Russia, a certain, per, a certain illustrious personage. Right, um, right. You know, you can't read the book because it's, it's in English, and there isn't a new modern biography mm -hmm. of Catherine the Great and Prince Potemkin, but, the, but a certain personage is very interested in about how they conquered Ukraine and, Crimea, and annexed Crimea uh. in between 1774 and 91, which was the partnership of these two amazing people. Wow. And so would you write a short sort of thing about it while we get it translated? So I did that. And funny enough, when, and it, by coincidence, this isn't just a terrible name dropping session. By no, the way. we think, but, you but, made, did you start, did you lay the roadmap? To the, well, no, the thing I'm was, kidding. I'm not taking responsibility <laughs> no. for everything that's happened since. But when George W. Bush arrived, he had also read my Catherine the Great of Potemkin uh -huh. book. And as an expert on first ladies, he slightly gruesomely revealed that him and 
Laura Bush read the love letters to each other Ooh. in the White House. There you go. Which we don't want to dwell on too long. <laughs> but but um, when he arrived, um, him, and, him and Putin, they arrived, and they, Putin greeted him at the Hermitage, which, of course, is the old palace of Catherine the Great. Mm -hmm. And he said, who do you want to see? Peter the Great, or, and, and, and he said, Potemkin. And so um, Putin said, well, I've just been reading about Potemkin as well. And so that was a rather exciting moment for me as a sort of first-time historian. And um, afterwards, when he did read it in, in Russian, um, I, I got contacted again by his people, and they said, listen, we've, President Putin loves the book, and we want to give you a present. And of course, presidents from President Putin can be worrying. <laughs> I, was um, say. I wasn't sure if I, I, I almost said I don't want the present. But, um, but actually, I, I said, well, I'd love the present. And he said, well, the present is um, we are opening the archives of Stalin, the private archives wow. of Stalin. Would you like to be the first person who works on them? And so that was amazing because I, you know, I arrived at the sort of the um, Marxism Leninism Institute where Stalin's mm -hmm. archives were. And I went there every day for a year. And I, went, and I had my own room. And wow. while everyone else could, you know, could only apply for two documents a day, mm -hmm. I had sort of them bringing in piles of them. And they could, <laughs> they could help me. They said, no, this is Beria writing here, or this is Molotov. And here's Stalin. Did they you help speak me. Russian? Or I, learned, I learned Russian very badly okay. in order to write these books. Right. And so, um, and handwritten Russian is very hard to write. So I, they helped yeah. me. And um, I made great friends with them all. And when the book came out, Stalin recorded the Red Tsar, um, Putin hated it. And so I fell from favor completely. <laughs> and it's, a great, it's an amazing thing. I, I'd enjoyed, the, I'd enjoyed the, um, the warm glow of the favor of the Kremlin. <laughs> and then I felt the cold, icy breeze of the tundra um, <laughs> as I tried to go back to write my next book. And when I went in there, they said, like, who are you? I said, what do you mean? I spent, I spent a year with you every day. <laughs> And I just want my old room back. And they said, we don't remember you ever having your own room. Wow. So that was young Stalin, which I wrote. Wow. Do you think there will be a time when Putin, I mean, you, you know, barring his death, ever steps down or steps aside? Or... I mean, I, I, I think he'll stay in power as long as he can, unless he's forced out. Yeah. And I think the only way he'll go out is um, if he dies. He'll probably just die in power. I mean, there's no reason to see anything but change now. I, I should just say that, the fascinating thing is, when they took Kherson in, in southern Ukraine, one of the places that Putin, uh, Potemkin had founded, mm -hmm. they also took the tomb of Prince Potemkin. And when they retreated um, last year, um, Putin ordered them to steal the body of Prince Potemkin. Wow. And they've taken it back to Moscow, so it's interesting to see what will happen. But um, I, you know, I, I think Putin will remain in power unless there's a catastrophic military um, episode, episode, because Russians have a way of treating people um, who are leaders who are responsible for big defeats. They, they treat them pretty ruthlessly. I mean, in the Romanovs, I wrote about Peter III, Catherine the Great's husband, who was strangled, um, Paul I, who was stomped to death, um, and so brutal. on. I mean, it's very brutal. I mean, in modern times, um, you know, the best example is Khrushchev. He wasn't killed, but he was, over, he was overthrown a year after the Cuba Missile Crisis, roughly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when he, was, when, he was, when he was being dismissed, he was sort of told, um, you know, that was the biggest humiliation Russia's, so Russia's ever had. You're, you're out. So, um, so that, that could also happen to him. But, you know, it's, it's, it's also quite possible that the whole system will last and will just, when he goes, another... another um, Sort of secret, secret peace, you know, checkist um, will will come up and take power after him, and the system will continue. Yeah, not necessarily a family, but the system. Do you think that history can still teach us things, even going back this far? You know, f not just retelling it, but are we are we too far removed from the lessons of of you know early early times, or do you think it's still? I mean, I think, I think the great thing about history is that there are lessons and they're moral. Part of it is it's a great entertainment. Part of it is it's got great moral lessons. And that's why history is so important and powerful. And that's why, you know, I knew Putin was going to invade Ukraine when he wrote an essay about the history, talking about people like Potemkin and Catherine and Potemkin. I mean, um, Sergei Lavrov, his, his foreign minister, he was asked by someone like, 
who, who advised Putin when he invaded? And he said he only has three advisors, Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, and Catherine, <laughs> and Catherine the Great, and, um, which, yeah. is, which is all you need to know. So in one sense, we have way too much history, because right. what really matters is how people want to live now yeah. with their families. That's the theme of my book, really. Um, but that said, history has this amazing um, power as uh, justification, as legitimizer, as, mm -hmm. as, as, as a sort of powerful story from the past that can shape the present. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important that history is, you get history right, and one doesn't have na narrow ideological history, because that's surely always going to be oversimplified and wrong. Mm -hmm. And real history is about, is messy, is nuanced, is complex. Yeah. And it's really important that, it's, that, we, that we study history. And the lessons from it are clear when you read them. Yeah. I mean, the great thing about being a historian is um, you're always right because you've got hindsight. <laughs> um, but we're always asked to predict things. And of course, historians are terrible prophets, yeah. as, ev as is everybody. Right. Right. Um, it's very hard to predict the future. But, but do you think in a way history, I, I worry watching the world that there's the difference between history lessons and nostalgia. Like, oh, we want to go back to how it was. And how, yeah. and how did those things intersect. Well, people often say, you know, um, history's cyclical, isn't it? No, not really. Not really, yeah. Is it linear? No, it's not linear either. Does it repeat itself first as, first as tragedy and second as farce, as Marx famously um, joked? Not really either. No. The fact is that the, the present time, I mean, again, just to go back, because we're on that subject, to look at Putin. I mean, Putin, in one sense, he's, you know, he, he, he's, 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 he's very like the, you know, Nicholas I, for example. Um, in another sense, he's very, he wants to be like a war leader like Stalin. All, all Russian leaders want to command in battle. Right. Even Nicholas II went and commanded in battle, you know, disastrously. But it's, it comes from Peter the Great. Peter the Great had it all. Mm -hmm. He's one of the most fascinating characters. I mean, he's a big character yep. in this book and my other books. And I mean, he was just, he just, he was just able, he, he had the basics that you need for politics, mm -hmm. which are, you've got to have vision. Without vision, it's all, it's all for nothing, or just managing, managing things. Right. Um, but you have to have the acumen to actually put the vision into practice. Mm -hmm. And that's often missing, because you have someone who's got these big ideas and says they want to do all this stuff, but they don't know how to do it. Right. And then right. lastly, you have to have the resources to pay for all this stuff. Otherwise, neither, neither, neither vision nor acumen are any use. And Peter the Great was one of those people, as was Catherine, who had those things in spades. He had all three. Yeah. And so he could change a lot. But one, one of the things he did was he commanded the Russian army, as well as being kind of effectively his own prime minister, his own president, his own you know, um, chief of the church. Um, he did everything himself, basically. And he also commanded the Battle of Poltava in 1709, defeated the Swedes, and made Russia a great power. And by the way, not, you know, when, you, when you write a world history, you realize how short modern times is. I mean, you think of Russia as going to be a constant forever in world affairs. Russia was only invented by Peter the Great. He invented the name, right? Russia. It's a sort of Hellenized version of Rus. Mm -hmm. And he invented that country in 1721, 1722. So it's only 300 years old. And Russia is no older than America, really. Yeah. Um, and all these, all these cities in, in the south, Ukraine, like Odessa, all these cities which were built by Prince Potemkin, who I wrote the biography of, um, they were founded at exactly the same time as Washington and Jefferson. It's very recent. So amazing. Well, that's also why you sort of, going back as far as you do, you really get the sense of how new, you know, our culture and civilization really is. It's only by going back that yeah. you, you really... And it's only it. then we get perspective about yeah. what's happening. Um, we become obsessed with one area of the world or another area, or one story or another, and we kind of, we, we, and we, we don't realize that often they're quite typical. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the fact is, it's really important to, to be a historian. Of course, in America, we can travel around, like, as, as we are here, talking about his, without, without too many jeopardy, we, too much jeopardy, we hope. Sure. But um, if you're in Russia or Iran or many of the Arab countries, mm -hmm. um, if you were a historian in Syria, for example, I mean, you, you know, it's a very dangerous profession. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I was, I was recently, somebody rang me up in the middle of the night, and I said, what happened? And they said, you know, 
a, a historian in Russia, his, his flat has been raided by the secret police, and he helped me write my Stalin books. Wow. So, you know, you yeah. realize that the jeopardy is intense, and that's why, um, you know, one of, my, one of the people I write about in the book is Ibn Khaldun, the great, the great Arab uh, historian. Um, his brother was, assassin was also a historian and was assassinated by a rival historian. So, so you know, and so that's one part of it, the rivalry of other historians. But, another, but, you know, more to the point is, you know, politicians have always tried to control narratives. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the characters in the book who really was my inspiration for writing this was Sima Qian, who was at the first century BC hereditary court historian of the Han dynasty of China. And when he was writing his history, the emperor decided that when he was describing some old tyrant, he was actually describing the present emperor, mm. which was a very dangerous thing to do. And he, that's exactly what he was doing. Yeah. And he thought the emperor wouldn't notice, but the emperor did. Emperors do. <laughs> and so he was called in, he was arrested, and he was given the choice of either execution or castration. And um, he... he he, he preferred execution, wow. but he had to finish his world history. And so he chose, um, he chose castration. And I, I, I care for what I say, because I know there are many school children in the house. <laughs> but as you can imagine, castration is a very dangerous thing in the, in the age before, um, you know, before anesthetic. Penicillin. And penicillin <laughs> and everything. And something between sort of 60 and, we don't know exactly, of course, but something between 60 and 80% of people who were castrated died of, yeah. you know, died of, 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 of you know, germs or whatever, right. blood loss, shock. And so, but, th but Sima Kiam wrote a letter to his a friend and he said, you know, I've chosen this terrible mutilation so I can finish a book that will be read in villages and towns and foreign countries across the seas. And so he, 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 he underwent it, he survived, and he finished the book, um, which is an amazing thing. And I had his letter beside me mm -hmm. as I was writing my book, and I would have undergone anything to finish this book, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but I want to reassure you that I, I, have, I finished the book intact. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that feels... Now I feel much better when the White House calls and you see that number and you know they're going to yell at you about something you've written. That's like, no, yeah. no I, won't, I won't even break a sweat You're not anymore. going through that. You're not going through that. <laughs> Piece of cake. Um, I think we're, we want to take some questions. That feels we like can. a good moment to, yeah, to, we do, can. to do that Yeah, we can. We can do here. anything, anyone, talk about anything, anything. Anything. Does yeah. anyone have questions or have a question? There's a gentleman right here in the middle. If you could just, there's a microphone coming to you, sir. Thank you. And if you could just, yep. Yeah, State your question. Yeah. Yeah. We're in political season now, so we're hearing the phrase over and over again about the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, or the arc of history. After writing this book, after all the work that you've done, do you believe that? No, I don't, actually. I mean, I think that it's a very attractive, um, attractive uh, some, um, something to emulate, something to aim for. And I think that what is interesting is that um, there is a sort of progress, but much of it is technical. And um, that is, a, that is, there is an arc of progress in technology. And one of the things I write about in the book is, you know, it's an extraordinary thing. Uh, it's not a moral thing, but it, <clears throat> but it leads to some moral, it leads to some moral advances. Um, and so the techno technology and open technology is linked to moral progress, but it doesn't guarantee it. That's what I, that's, I think that's the right answer. But, you know, if you look, if you look at world history, you know, daily life in villages was pretty much the same mm -hmm. for thousands of years until the early 19th century or the late 18th century when the Industrial Revolution happened. And even then it remained very much the same. It was really medical advances, advances in food, advances in fertilizers, in, in, all invented by German, German uh, chemists, by the way. Um, who, who changed the human life. And, you know, by the end of the 19th century, there were suddenly huge changes. I think there's one figure that's interesting. Age expectancy um, in Sierra Leone today, which is not a sort of advanced country in Africa, in West Africa, is the same now as it was in France and Britain in 1900 when they were the most powerful empires in the world. So that gives you an idea of how much things have improved. 
So interesting. Yeah. Scary. Do we have another? Oh, there's some here. The gentleman will come to you with the microphone. It's coming. So I'd love to know, what are some of the consistent human behaviors that you have seen, though the context changed or the time changes? Are that, what are those threads that tend to run through uh, that's, that's, human that's history that are fairly predictable? That's a very good question. You know, the, you know the, 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 what I think is, what I, I, I realized when I was starting to write my book on Stalin mm -hmm. was that you know, though people look like us and walk like us and have children like us, it's, it's very important to realize that they're not like us. Right. And so one has to approach the past and I think historians have to approach us with real humility and realize that when I was talking, when I, was read, when I started to read the Bolsheviks' letters to each other, I realized they were talking, they, they existed in a completely different worldview. And it would be the same if you were writing about, you know, the regime of Khamenei in, in, in um, the Islamic Republic of Iran today. So, you know, so even people in our own times look at the world in a completely different worldview from us. So though there are many kind of, um, chains that run through human life, like love of children, for example, um, like ambition, um, like, like, a, like the need for, for food and water and basics. All of these things, of course, are consistent. There, there are famous um, tomb portraits at Fayoum in Egypt. I don't know if any of you have visited Egypt. And they're, they're portraits of extraordinary beauty. Look them up. The faces on these portraits are so beautifully painted and they look like someone who could live next door to you today. Um, and yet they lived in a completely different mental universe. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is, that is a very important thing to understand. Is that, you know, so I'm always reminding myself when I'm writing this, like, try and read your way into this world, but presume you don't really understand anything about these people. <laughs> One thing that runs through all of it, though, which is interesting and is very relevant today, is that whatever age you look at, 7,000 years ago, uh, 5,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, the millennium of 1,000, the second millennium of 2,000, and now, today, in 2023, every single generation feels the world is about to end. And that runs through all of human existence. And I think the reason for it is that there's a sense of the fragility of our supremacy on, in the world, a sense of guilt that we have conquered the earth, um, a, a, and a sense of guilt of, of, of what we've done to achieve it, mm -hmm. and, a, and also a sense of our own tininess compared with nature and the universe. So I think that that's the key to it. And of course, you know, all the t throughout history, people have suffered massive um, pandemics and natural disasters, which are, which are all in the book, of yep. course. And I wrote this book in COVID, during COVID. I know, I was going to say that when you talk about the, the numbers are startling for the Black Death. Or, I mean, it just, it just, it's great. It was, when you think about it, what we all went through. In the yes, yeah. I mean, history. of course, I'd never written the book without COVID because, I mean, I wasn't quite sure how I was ever going to write it. But in COVID, I was just locked down. Right. And so... That's why, um, it's, that's why it's 1,200 yeah, pages. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was always going to be long, because the idea was, like... Because I mean, there are great short histories of everything now. Right. And the whole point was to get it as long as it could get into a book, but not go, over, go into two volumes. So that was always the idea. And so did your it editor... Is, with, did they ever just faint that away when they saw your... No, book? but they, they were... I mean, they were worried about whether it would work when I told them yeah. it. Yeah. And they... Um, and of course, I mean, I, I work in such a sort of strange way because when I write one of these books, I, I start at the beginning, I put loud music on, and I write for about six months or a year without stopping or wow. looking back at all. And I never read anything through. And then when I get to the end, um, I just start to read the book with a pen. And I read it aloud to myself, and I change everything. And during that process, I am the most kind of brutal editor of myself. Mm -hmm. And in writing this, I think I, I cut 100,000 words out of it. I mean, partly because it wouldn't have gone into a book, so I had to. Right. But partly because a lot of the time I'm thinking like, no, this isn't actually quite right. This isn't what I want it to be. And I did the same with Jer the Jerusalem book, which is the book that sold the most around the world. Mm. Um, weirdly, it sold over a million copies in China. Interesting. Which is, which is weird, but there it is. 
What, um, this is the sort of f fun fact. So what loud music do you, what, what, what do you? It's funny you should say that. This is the first history book that has a playlist on Spotify. That's, that's, I would love and, to And um, it, has, it has a playlist. <laughs> It's called The World, um, a soundtrack, and it, do look it up. It's under my name. And it's what, how it started was, I like to listen to sort of, you know, um, you know things that are, you know, like if I was writing about the 50s, I listened to Elvis Presley. If I listened to, you know, or, or, or Frank Sinatra, um, I listened, you know, and, and so I started to try and listen to things that were appropriate. When I was writing about the fall of the Soviet Union, I listened to the Scorpions' Winds of Change. So I tried to fit everything. That's cool. Um, and so, um, and, I, and I, love, I love things like Bowie, and he's in the book, and Sinatra, and so on. So there's lots, of, there's lots of music in the book, by the way, because that's part of kind of getting the feel of life. Yeah. And so afterwards, I suddenly thought, actually, I'm going to make a playlist of all this, the, great, the greatest history songs of all time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. do look, and you oh, can I tell will. me if you don't approve. There's a great American, of course, there's tons of American stuff in there from you know, Joan Baez, the night they drove old Dixie down mm -hmm. um, for the Civil War or whatever. There's yeah. tons of stuff. Um, and, um, I love how your brain works. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, and, the, and, and so it's got, and it, but it's also got lots of foreign stuff from Ukraine, from Iran, mm -hmm. from, from Africa, mm -hmm. um, which is all in there. And it's, it's a great listen. But if you have any ideas, do write to me and I'll put them in. <laughs> if, I've miss, if I've missed any. By the way, the, the number one history song of all time, I think, is the Stones... Sympathy for the Devil, yeah. which, which is, because which, a history song can either be a song that's about history, like that is, yep. or a song that made history. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, so, so that's number one, because it, that talks about all the monstrosities of the 20th century. Yeah. Right. But tell me if you disagree. <laughs> Do you, uh, do you, when you, un do you unwind with like chiclet or like, what do you read? Yeah, I love thrillers. <laughs> I love thrillers. thrillers. No, no, I I, that's I, what I mean. I, the only thing I read, apart, because the nightmare of this book was I had to read everything that yeah. came out in a new subject. So you do take a break. So I, and I was just kind of reading things manically and I had books being delivered in person. I don't know if you've seen this, there's a picture of my office because I had it all where well, I'm kind of surrounded by this. And in the end, I couldn't get, I had to crawl into the office <laughs> through a kind of passageway. Um, and, um, and so I, and I relaxed in the evening with exercise and also I did, I read thrillers and I love thrillers. Yeah. I like Michael Connolly thrillers. Mm -hmm. So I read all of his Bosch series and I'm always reading okay. and I love that. Um, but writing his book almost killed me. I mean, the process of oh, it. Oh, I'm sure. I, I, I mean, I'm sure. I didn't sleep for about three years. And I was always kind of waking up in the middle of the night realizing I'd left something out. Yeah. Um, you know, with a, with a terrible, sh with a, you know, which is, which I don't want to shock you with this, but I once woke up at three in the morning and, and said like, oh my God, I've left out Jesus Christ, you know, um, <laughs> which, which, you know, another time I woke up and it was, it was Wagner I left out and then another time Mozart. So, because the, the whole point of it is to approach everything that, everything that we expect it, but in an unfamiliar direction. Sure. So that may sound like a completely stupid story, but in fact, you know, Jesus Christ became important um, you know, long after his lifetime. And so, you know, so I was, I've, I sort of, I, I, he, he appears early on, but of course he becomes very important when Constantine the Great adopts Christianity. And so he appears in two different places. Yeah. But that's, so that's how I wrote it. Anyway, a crazy project. Yeah. But the great thing is I, I never have to write it again. <laughs> It's definitive. Do we have any more questions out there? There's some right here in the middle. This gentleman right here. In the oh, it's better now. Mm. I'm going to take this last bit. This, that's better because I can see the whole oh. thing. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the relationship between religion and politics and how it sort of compares to things today. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, you know, you can't, I, I, find, I think it's very hard to, under, to write world history or especially to write the history of the Middle East as I did with Jerusalem if you don't at least sympathize or understand religion. Um, religion is, you know, religion and politics are always inter, inter, interwoven. I mean, normally all religions required a political actor to, to, um, to propagate them, to spread them and to make them um, at the, to bring them to the center of power. You know, of course, Jesus Christ was, for example, was, was not a politician. 
Um, he didn't have a political movement. He didn't have a military arm. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, on the other hand, was both a religious leader and a political and military leader who created a state. Mm -hmm. So it took, as I mentioned earlier, Constantine the Great to put together right. um, you know, the teachings of Jesus Christ and the Roman state, which, made, um, which really made Christianity a world religion. If he chose, he could have chosen another religion. And if you're, if you're a believer, you'll say that that's impossible because he would have chosen the right religion. Um, but if you're a secular person, you could say that you know, Constantine could have chosen any relatively popular cult at that time. And we might all be believing it now. Um, so these things are all arguable. But you, you, one of the things that's interesting also is that, of course, we believe that um, though many people, there, there, there are more and more religious people in, in, um, in the Middle East, in, in, in evangelical movement in America and so on, and there's a huge evangelical movement in West Africa, mm -hmm. um, but there are also many people who now count themselves secular, and many societies that really count themselves secular, including the States and, and Britain and, and France and so on. And yet, um, I think the religiosity of people is deeply ingrained in human nature. And there are many views today that are almost religious. And there are many, uh, I mean, for example, climate change today. Mm -hmm. uh, just, as, just as in this sort of, if you in the, in the 14th century, if you said that Jesus Christ didn't exist and wasn't divine, people would literally lock you up and say you were insane. Yeah. The same is true with, with climate change today. I mean, I'm a believer in climate change, so don't, I'm not denying it. <laughs> but we do regard people who don't believe in it as mad, don't we? And so that is a very so the, there are, there is a secular religion with all sorts of features and its own saints um, that exists even in the most secular societies. So religion is always with us. Are we there, good? Was there one more question the one, somewhere? Okay. Get this gentleman to the. If there is, do ask it. He's uh, Yeah, you could stand up. Thank hi. Hey, so you mentioned that. Uh, this like current 70 year period of like democracy has been like an unprecedented and kind of like unique time, but that also people were like kind of losing faith and we're seeing a reverting to family power struggles like the Marcos in the Philippines. Do you think we're going to see a reversal of this trend in the coming decades? Or do you think that like this trend of keeping on establishing Western like democracies like Britain and the United States and other countries is going to continue? Um, that's, a, that's the million, that's the billion dollar question. Uh, thank you for asking it. Um, I, I think personally that, um, that, you know, that, that we are now in a period when we're going to see um, a continuing conflict. Um, but